thank you very much for that introduction. So what you see on stage right now is a representation of hundreds of billions of dollars. Just that. Now that I have your attention, <laughs> let's talk about video games. Yes, video games. Over the years, or starting with the gamer it's himself or herself, a lot of people do play these games. And there's no sort of gender, age restriction, or even the game type. By definition, a gamer is one who plays games, and that's it. So from the audience here, a show of hands, who is a gamer? OK, a good number of people, which is good, you know? So the thing is, the type of game also, as I said, is not a restriction. So it could be something as big as the action AAA games that we play to something as simple as Tetris. You've played Tetris before? You're a gamer. That's, that's just it. You know, there's no hidden cult or community or sort of conspiracy that gamers are do. It's just anyone that plays. I am a gamer. I play a lot of games. Let me tell you a story of what happened when I was a lot younger. Back home, you'll hear my parents asking, in a Sadiq, where is Sadiq? Then one of my siblings would reply, I had to figure out why I a game. Then that's, uh, sorry, that's saying he's gone, to some, he's gone to his neighbor's house to play a game. And then they would say, Jacob Daudish. That's my brother's cue to go and bring me back home. And then an hour later, you hear again, in Asadik. Exactly. So what brings us towards, what pulls us to this sort of medium of entertainment? Why do we feel gravitated towards it? Why do we enjoy it? And like any other form of media, it brings something unique. Let's say you're reading a really good book. You really get into it. The word starts to disappear. The book itself is just something you're holding. And you start imagining the rich detail of this world you're reading about, the characters themselves. You start maybe putting yourself as one of the characters or start casting maybe some movie stars as the characters in the book. Or you're watching a good movie. You start getting emotionally invested. You start rooting for the protagonist. You hate the antagonist. The antagonist is just an actor playing as someone else, but you feel like you don't like this man whenever they show him on screen, or you don't like this person. That's the sort of unique feeling you get from these media, from these forms of media. And video games also have that. They give you the chance to explore. For me, this is what drags me, this is what pulls me into video games. I get to do things I can't do in real life. I get to explore different worlds. I can tell you I've driven exotic cars like the Bugatti Veyron. I can't afford it, but I've crashed more Bugatti Veyrons, I believe, than <laughs> the ones that are actually produced in the real world. So I get the chance to do all these things, you know? Which is really good. It's for everyone. And over the years, we've seen the progress of video games and how they've improved. There are people right now, probably within the audience here, that were alive when video games weren't commercially available. But they've been progressing exponentially from a sprite art that's one of the technologies behind it, to full 3D polygons, to dynamic lighting and shadows, and so on and so forth. That's on the software aspect alone. You see this 
really impressive breakthroughs within video games. But it's something that someone would easily scoff at. They'd say, you're wasting your time playing games. You know? But for someone curious, from playing, you start to see, okay, what goes on behind the curtain? And telling you the truth, a lot of really brilliant men and women come together and put these things together. They are professionals in the industry, and they bring breakthrough after breakthrough just for video games. It's not just. And in the on the hardware aspect also, we have seen video games push consumer electronics to its limits. Every year you see a new piece of hardware, or you see after every generation of console, you see a new, more powerful console, which, which are really impressive pieces of engineering. But they are there just to play video games. These things push consumer electronics to its limits, which is a good thing. You get to see an improvement on your electronic, which trickles down from the enthusiasts to the average consumer. You get to see that progress. And you can see this is just a small snippet of the input devices we use in video games, from the D-pad to the analog sticks to the more obscure racing wheels. And the most current one? is virtual reality. Speaking of virtual reality, on a typical sort of gaming session, you know, you have you, the player, sitting down, playing your video game, holding the controller, you press two buttons, and the character on screen does like 15,000 flips. You know, which, yeah, that's good. You get to do what you can't do in real life. But for virtual reality, that ratio is one to one. If you turn your head, the character does that. You raise your arm, the character does that. I can't do 15,000 flips. So that won't be possible with the headset. But that doesn't mean the headset isn't a good input device for video games. Like, there are really good games that I've actually tried which you see re uh, really intelligent ways of going around this restriction and sort of having it woven into the narrative and other really creative and smart ideas to sort of, you know, with every restriction comes, restriction is like uh, an instigator of creativity. Once they say you can't do this, you find a way to achieve it. You know, that's, that's what you get, or that's what you see. So, but not just in video games. Imagine adopting this technology that video games have come up with in other fields. Let's see architecture. I can't pick, I, I didn't pick architecture at random because I'm an architect. I can't switch that architecture brain off. It's always on. So, putting it in architecture, you have your virtual reality device and you want to showcase your idea to your client or your colleagues. So they get to see your design and feel the scale of the space and everything without the house or the space being built. It's virtual, but they get to fully experience it. There are a lot of really amazing examples online, and we've come with a small sample here. So with a quick show of hands, who here has never experienced virtual reality? Okay, uh, let's call the young man here. If, wait, could you come up, please? Round of applause for him. Please, another round of applause for our volunteer. Could you take off your cap? So what you're about to go into now is a single bedroom sort of studio apartment. You get to see the space and visualize how, what goes on and how all the spaces sort of feel together. So just hold this. You push this button and you teleport to another space. That's it. So push the button. 
Okay, look around. Turn fully. Exactly. So you can fully experience the space. Push the button again. Now you're in the bedroom. Well, you're on stage right now, but... <laughs> Exactly. So yeah, this is just a small demonstration of the possibilities of what this can do. So let me take this off you. Another round of applause, please. For, uh, thank, you. thank you very much. So this is just a possibility of what this can do in architecture. And imagine a few years from now when all this is shrunken down to the pair of glasses I'm wearing, you know? So what, what I'm saying is, you can see technology bringing two fields, games and architecture, that doesn't have a lot in common, but it's bringing them closer than ever. And the thing is, it is more obvious than ever now as we are, that Technology is the future. There's no two ways about it. It's not a prediction, it's a fact. It's what's going to help us in the future, and it's what we're using right now. Everybody here it's, is using a piece of technology, knowingly or, unknow knowingly or unknowingly. Well, knowingly, obviously, everybody here. But the thing is, we keep not prioritizing this in our schools, in our professional fields. I've met full-fledged architects that don't know how to use a computer, or engineers. You know, that's on the professional level. But what about the regular person? If a professional can't do that, you know? And the thing is, The thing is, we can't look away from this forever. We're being left behind. Day by day, we're being left behind, not prioritizing this, not putting this front and center. So whatever field you're in, it doesn't matter. You use technology. Be up to date. Understand what this new piece of technology does and try to use it see how it will improve or add value to what work you do. Imagine a few years from now, I, I hope it's, it won't take that long, that this becomes popular between, well, amongst architects. And the client comes to an architect and tells him, okay, I've seen my design, show me my virtual reality tour of my building. And the client, or sorry, the architect would say, what is virtual reality? You know? By saying that, he's officially been left behind. And there's nothing he can do about it. So that's why I keep pushing. No matter what, what you do, it's something you should try and update yourself. Try and improve on what you, what you are today. Be, a better, be better the next time. You do something now, you find easier, not easier, that's for me, to be honest. Whenever I do something, I just find somehow some easier way to do it. But you find a better way to do that. And even uh, in our field of, sorry, in our education, someone just spoke about education, so that's something I'm not going to touch. But yes, this is something we need to raise awareness of. Thank you very much.